if you give people enough value over time, over time they want to give to you. Van, hello. Welcome back to the Wild Business Growth Podcast presented by Hippo Direct. This is your place to hear from a new entrepreneur or innovator every single Wednesday morning who's turning wild ideas into wild growth. I'm your host, Max Brandstetter, podcasting dude at Hippo Direct, and you can reach me at max at hippodirect.com for help bringing your podcast to life and using it as a business building tool. This is episode number 108, and today's guest is Philip Van Dusen. Philip is the founder and chief creative officer of Verhal Brand Design and is a legend in the design and branding space. He previously led branding and design at PepsiCo and a number of other companies and has led the works for brands such as P&G, Old Navy, Dockers, Gap, and more. In this interview, we dig into creativity, design, how to build your personal brand, and a t-shirt he is responsible for that you probably have worn yourself or at least seen someone else wearing. It's Philip Van Dusen, whose name is incredibly fun to say. Enjoy the show. All righty. We are here with the creative design genius, the founder of Verhall Brand Design, maybe the most calming voice out there. So I'll just call you the human de-stressor as well. Philip Van Dusen, how are you doing today, Philip? Wow. I hope I live up to the de-stressor moniker. That's, that's a high bar. You already are. I've never felt more relaxed in my life. But <laughs> Thanks, Max. <laughs> Thank you for joining. This is really cool. I'm just consistently blown away by your stuff. And so we're going to get into a lot of fun chat about branding and design today. But before that, you know, it's always interesting hearing backgrounds and upbringing. And for you, I think something that blows me away is I don't want to start with your early years. I want to start with your family's roots in moving to New York in the first place. Can you share mm-hmm. that story? Yeah, sure. And it's funny. That's the first time I've been asked that on a podcast. Oh, fantastic. My name, last name is Van Dusen, which is a Dutch name, obviously. And my family originally came to New York in 1623. So almost 400 years ago. Came to New York before it was New York. It was New Amsterdam at that point and mostly populated by people from the Dutch East India Trading Company. And my first ancestor, Abraham Peterson Van Dusen, was a miller and a tavern owner. And he also became a member of the Council of Eight, which was actually the first governing body in New Amsterdam. That was my first ancestor. And so my roots of entrepreneurship go back to before America was America. And I take, I take a lot of pride in that. And the funny thing is, is that I, my agency is called Verhal Brand Design. Verhal is Dutch for the word story. And I get asked by a lot of people, you know, you have a Dutch agency name. Your name is Dutch. You don't have a Dutch accent. And I'm like, yeah, we lost that about 400 years ago. <laughs> Not too recently then. Has your family always stayed in this New York or previously New Amsterdam area? Uh, no, it, and it's actually very funny. New York Times did a fairly significant article on my family in the magazine a number of years ago. And my brother, who for a long period of time was a real estate agent in New York, actually ended up settling about five blocks from where my first ancestor um, kind of made his his stead. And we just were kind of blown away by that. It's kind of like this weird time tunnel that kind of drew our family back to the exact physical location. But actually, Van Dusen's are all over the country. Um, because we've been here so long, there are a number of branches of the family. My particular branch was located mostly in the Midwest in the Detroit area and then kind of fanned out from there. Um, But there's a lot of us up here in the Northeast and in the Midwest, there's a whole Western contingent. So we're kind of all over the place now. You just can't get away from the Van (laughs) Dusen's. That's so cool. You don't hear about too often families that have roots so early in the U.S. before it was even the U.S. And when New York had a different name, it's just crazy to think about. Skipping maybe just a couple years ahead, 
when you came into the picture. Yeah. What are some early memories you have of being drawn towards design? Well, the funny thing is, is I actually am trained as a painter. I, I got my master's degree in painting. I actually don't have a degree in design. And so I was drawn to art and I was a fine artist up until my my 30s, actually. And I was teaching. I, I taught photography and drawing in the Lacoste School of Art in the south of France was my last teaching gig. And when I came back to the United States from that teaching engagement, I had done a lot of artwork there that I was really excited about, some monotypes, and I decided to put them on t-shirts and sell them. And that was kind of my leap into kind of concerted entrepreneurship, but also into the apparel industry. And I walked, the, this is before the internet, so I'm dating myself. I walked the entire island of Manhattan looking for boutiques and shops with my little sample case to sell my t-shirts to stores. And I learned a lot about supply and demand. I learned a lot about uh, design for products. And uh, that's where I really fell in love with, with design. Are your legs still tired from that walk? <laughs> I know, really. Yeah. I know New York very well, though. Yeah. Well, technically New Amsterdam, but... Right. <laughs> <laughs> but you have this background in fine arts, which turned into t-shirts, and then a bit more. But from the art standpoint, what do you like about art in general? What do I like about art? I think that, you know, the big difference between art and design is that art is about self-expression and design is about communication. And while self-expression can be communication, fine art is really more about expressing your own interests, your own point of view, you know, your own conceptual ideas, where design is really much more around the beholder. It's, it's about communicating and, and eliciting some sort of action in uh, the person that you're doing the, the creative work for. So they very much separate, I think, down that line. And in t-shirt design, actually in apparel design, I found that happy medium between the two. There, you know, people were attracted to a particular graphic on a shirt and they would buy it because they wanted to wear it on themselves. And that was a product. But when I was doing sh shirts in the very beginning, it was very much of an artistic expression. And I didn't care that much about whether people really liked it or not. I was just putting my artwork out there. And then I was happily surprised when I would see people walking down the street in New York City with one of my designs on it. But I mean, I love art because it's all about self-expression. And I find so much in the world to be inspiring visually. And uh, I just, it's just been part of my DNA since the very beginning. It clearly is. And my first job ever was as a t-shirt printer. So this has taken really? me back. Yeah. Yeah. I distinctly remember the ink and the squeegee. Well, the ink is probably still on all my clothes, but right. the squeegee and the, you know, doing the manual printing there, I actually had a, an affinity for the uh, water spray gun as well. That was pretty fun, but really cool that you had this pivotal moment in the t-shirt world that you really added a layer of business sense to your interest in art. What's the biggest lesson you took from selling these t-shirts and discovering this new sort of business world? What I really took away from it was that it wasn't about me. <laughs> it was about the customer. <laughs> making that straddling point across self-expression to communication or providing someone with something that they wanted that would help them express themselves or that, you know, motivated them to actually part with some of their money in order to take a product into their lives. And that was the big shift for me was realizing that I had to do design work that was going to be magnetic to another person so much so that they want to purchase it. And that kind of that moment is when it becomes not about you, not about your likes, your aesthetics. It becomes around the desires and the aspirations of the, of the consumer. And that's where you move from fine art into business, I think. And the apparel industry, the t-shirt, graphic t-shirt industry in particular, is one of those places where those two uh, kind of forces converge in a very interesting way. Because a lot of designers and a lot of fine artists, when they're looking to monetize their work at the very beginning, a lot of them think t 
t-shirts at the very beginning. And that's where they go. And I think a lot of people come to this point in their lives where they suddenly start making the realization that it's about business and it's about what my customer wants, not necessarily as much of what I want. So let's move from fine arts to business. Sure. So you had this experience in the t-shirt world. When did you realize that you wanted to have a full-fledged career that you know now has spanned a couple decades in this design and branding space, even at some big, big time companies and design firms? Mm -hmm. Well, the interesting thing is I've always been a teacher. I've always loved teaching and I've always loved learning. And when I was a fine artist, I went and got my master's degree in order to teach. But finding teaching work at the university level at that period of time was very, very competitive, very difficult. And so I was very frustrated by the fact that I couldn't find the level uh, teaching gig that I wanted. And then when I went into the apparel industry and started working at apparel companies and very quickly started to manage other designers, because I have a head for finance and organization and planning that many creatives don't have, I have this right left brain kind of marriage. I started managing designers and found that managing other creative people was a lot like teaching, except you weren't out of work every nine months and you made a whole lot more money. And that's where everything kind of took off. That's where I started to really learn much more deeply about business. But then I also learned more about how to truly, truly manage creative people in a business setting where you're you're mentoring them, you're setting them up for success, you're teaching them, you know, the emotional intelligence and the communication skills in order to operate and maneuver in a business context while still protecting and nurturing their creative energy. Because that's also a very delicate balance when you're managing creative people is that they're in a setting which can sometimes be constrictive or frustrating for them as creative people. But you also want to enable them to succeed, make more money, advance, and do their best work. So that's where I really found, I think, my calling is where I, I suddenly realized that and started to realize that I was really good at it. You certainly are. And you clearly have that left brain, right brain. Which of those areas, if you look at the teaching side of things and then the pure creative artwork output side of things, which of those elements do you feel you're most passionate about? I'm definitely more passionate about teaching at this point in my career. I've, you know, I've done the, you know, the design, the mouse pushing, the creative part of it for, as you said, a couple decades. And I've made my mark, you know, I've made my mark across some of the biggest brands in the world. And that's been incredibly satisfying. And now I'm really moving into the phrase, phase where I want to mentor and grow and help other people succeed in their creative journeys and their creative and this new incredible creative economy that we are finding ourselves in. Because really in the last decade, the economy has changed so dramatically in terms of opportunities for creative professionals to succeed and grow and do an incredible amount of things. I know a lot about that and I want to set up people for success and pass on all of the knowledge that I've gained in my years in the industry onto them so they can hopefully not make all the mistakes that I made and they can, you know, they can survive and thrive in what is becoming both an economy that's much more competitive for creative people and design is being, you know, kind of increasingly commoditized. It's, it's on one hand, it's becoming much more difficult to make a living in design on the creative side. But then on the other side, there's this huge range of new opportunities in that every company in the world has to become a creative media company. And lots of them don't know how to do it. And if you're a designer, a creative pro in some way, shape, or form who can become a really great business partner for companies and clients, you can be very successful and have a huge impact on their business and also, you know, develop a great portfolio and get a great sense of fulfillment. Well, it's so cool that you're being so selfless and giving back to others. Obviously, that's a natural progression and it's, it's something that you are so passionate about. 
And I like this term, creative economy. Why is branding and design so important in today's creative economy? Well, I mean, a lot of people have been attributed to this quote, but people say Bill Gates said it or Gary Vee said it, but essentially every company needs to be a media company. And because of the massive proliferation of creative platforms across all of the social media platforms, across all of the new video platforms, both in broadcast and on the internet, because of every single you know, company needing to produce some sort of content to promote themselves. Many, many companies have no idea how to do that. They know, have no idea how to create a visualization of their company, communicate, even strategically figure out what their brand positioning is or what their communication tone of voice is or their visual style is, how to actualize that and make it into something that you can post somewhere and garner attention and drive people to your website or to your store or to your products or to your app whatever that is, every company has to engage in a much more complex level of marketing than ever existed before. I mean, 20 years ago, it used to be you did radio, TV, print, outdoor. That was it, right? Or maybe retail if you had a retail setting. Yeah. And now it's about 20 different kinds of major social media platforms and there are multiple platforms within those platforms from you know, Instagram stories to Instagram TV to the imagery of Instagram, the photography of Instagram. You get into Facebook, you get into you know, YouTube, Twitter, the list goes on and on and on. Companies have to show up in those settings. And they really, many times they don't have the internal staff, certainly the internal knowledge or capability to put themselves out there in a, a motivating, reputable, and exciting way, creative way. And that's where creative professionals are perfectly suited if they gather the right tool chest of capabilities on their own to help companies show up there. That's really what the change has been. In the last 10 years, Every company really, truly has to show up in a lot of different places in a very creative way to get any kind of attention because it's an attention economy too, right? In order to yeah. be successful today, it's really about gaining attention. And when we get into the you know crazy marketing campaign thing later in the in the chat, we, <laughs> we'll talk about that, that. Might be the new name of the segment. Thank you. Yeah, we'll talk about garnering garnering attention. Yeah, I think anybody can relate to scrolling through their phone and seeing the hundreds, if not thousands or tens of thousands of different posts and messaging every single day. On your end, you have worked at and led creative for some of the biggest brands out there. I mean, everything from PepsiCo to having clients, including P&G and Kraft. I mean, some of the biggest companies and brands out there. What lessons do you have about how brands today can break through and have effective branding with the help of really, really powerful and appealing design. How can they do it with design? I think that the answer is actually in the question, which is that they have to do it with design. Let's take PepsiCo, for instance. When Mauro Percini, who's the create, chief creative officer of PepsiCo, came in, PepsiCo was a, a non-design focused company. And they were in direct competition with one of probably the most creative companies in the world, Coca-Cola. And they knew that they had to build design as a very significant, strong competency inside of PepsiCo. And they hired an amazing man, Morrow, to do it. They realized that in order to remain competitive in today's marketplace, they had to make design king. And that had to drive every decision from product to mark, not just marketing, but from product to actually dispensing the product. So packaging, bottles, trucks, retail experience, all of that they had to dial up significantly in order to stay competitive with one of the most, probably the most recognized brand in the world. And I think that that is, that is really the story. Every company really has to look at themselves through that lens. And one of the things when I work with clients now that I find the most 
interesting is that, say for Pepsi and Coca-Cola, their competition and who they're up against is pretty clear, right? Everyone smaller than Pepsi is like eight degrees down from Pepsi. But <laughs> right. it's, you know, it's a, it's, a two, it's a two brown sugar water war going on, right? Your competitors are really clear. When I work with clients now, I am constantly amazed at how many companies have no idea who their competition is. They have no idea. They might say, we want to be the apple of window cleaning, you know, or whatever that is. But they have, if I go into a discovery call with them and I say, name three to five of your top competitors, they sometimes can name one, maybe two. And I say, how are those competitors showing up in the market? What social media platforms are they on? What does their website look like? How do their products stacked up to yours? What are they doing in terms of tone of voice or visual branding that you're not doing? And their eyes just kind of glaze over and they look very confused and frightened. And that's one of the things that I carry as a, as a banner in the work that I do, but also in the training that I do with my you know, mentees and my audience is that understanding and learning how to assess your competition and position yourself against your competition is one of the kind of key aspects of branding, number one, but also succeeding in the market. And that I think is that story of how do you, you know, what do you do with design? You leverage it to its greatest extent to differentiate you from your competition because it is about you know, there's this other great quote that it's, you know, different is better than better. Having the best product is not really the way to win. Being the most different and being able to garner the most attention, but then you do obviously have to show up with a great product, but that's really how to win these days in this attention economy. It's so important. I like how you put it that these two companies are selling basically brown sugar water. When you look at it from that standpoint and take design out of the equation, it's like, okay, this nothing really exciting about that. But then when you think of the names Coca-Cola and the names Pepsi, immediately you're thinking of their branding and their logo and their design and ads and everything and their packaging. Like it just adds so much life to it. It's really crazy to think about. And that's how people differentiate those two brands. I mean, in their core brand, <clears throat> excuse me, the core Pepsi, the core Coke, it is literally, they're almost exactly the same. When you get into the diets, that's where it really diverges. <laughs> I, have to, I have to say, I was a Diet Coke drinker. And then when I went to Pepsi, it's like, hey, you can't drink any Coke products. I'm like, oh, okay. So I had to switch to Diet Pepsi. Diet Pepsi is like so much better than Diet Coke. It's crazy. Ooh, shots anyway, fired. That's, that's a total aside. <laughs> yeah. And I'm not saying that because I used to run design for Pepsi. But, but you used but, to, you yeah, used to but run design. Helps. But I was forced to drink it. I was actually kind of forced to drink it. Yeah. It's funny how that works. I know. <laughs> I know, right? You become a brand advocate in very funny ways. But you're totally right in the fact that when people, you can have extremely similar products, but the branding will be what differentiates it in people's mind. And people, you know, they become brand advocates or brand devotees sometimes around the aesthetics or the tone of voice or the visual aspects of a brand. Very rarely is it, I mean, I'm not going to say very rarely. Sometimes you it could is say the product. It, we'll it. Sometimes it is the product itself, right? I mean, you look at Microsoft and Apple, they were about as incredibly different aesthetically, tone of voice, just every single aspect of the brand. But then they're also their products for a period of time, you know, the first 15 years of their lives were also very different, very markedly different. I think that they've kind of closed on each other a lot in the last decade. And I think they've, they've closed on each other in a lot of different ways, both in branding, um, visual branding and tone of voice, as well as product. Right. But still, I think they have such a, a different brand feel from each other yeah. and are still very differentiated. When you look back on your career, what are some of the most memorable projects that you worked on? I have to say, I'm not sure whether this still holds, but my team was responsible for designing the biggest selling t-shirt in history, which was the year 2000 Old Navy flag tee. Now in the heyday of Old Navy, I was the VP of design at Old Navy and I ran their graphic apparel group. And we were responsible for every, you know, Old Navy was 
the most successful retail endeavor in history. They hit a billion dollars in sales in under five years of their birth. And so that was a rocket ship ride to be part of in terms of an entrepreneurial, a very you know, fast growing company. Granted, they had the infrastructure of Gap Inc. that made that growth possible, but it was an incredible company to be part of. And the flag tee was, the 4th of July flag tee was by far the biggest selling product that we had. But when we hit the year 2000, we sold 1.4 million of those shirts in about a three week period of time. At the time, it meant one out of, it might've been 3 million. I don't even remember to tell you the truth, but we figured it out. It was like 1.2% of the population of the United States had bought one. And the really amazing thing about it was, is that we had to buy cotton futures in order to produce them. Huh. Meaning there wasn't enough knit cotton on the market to produce those shirts. You had to actually buy cotton in the fields before it was harvested in order to, oh. in order to produce the shirts. And we also figured out it was like 178 semi trailer trucks full of shirts to have that many shirts. Anyway, that was, a high, that was a high light of my life. And I still, to this day, see those t-shirts on the street. And it really, I was going to say, I've really seen it makes like- me happy. I hadn't thought about it until you said it, but yeah. now, like you say, the flag and Old Navy, I'm like, oh my God, I definitely remember those. And I, I think there's now probably so many different iterations of it, but the original one, which clearly, clearly is a best-selling t-shirt. What was the insight that led to the design of that shirt? I think as with a lot of products, sometimes it's just, it's trial and error just with marketing, you know, just with like with social media marketing, you try things. If you see that they're catching on, you leverage the winners and you sunset the losers. And that works with social media, it works with content marketing, and it works with product. And I think in 1994, so Old Navy's been doing flag tees for over 25 years now. They did, we did a little flag tee for the 4th of July and it just blew out of the doors. And we're like, huh, okay. Let's produce twice as many of them next year and we'll do it again on the fourth. And that's exactly what we did. And it just grew from there year after year after year. You leverage the winners and you sunset the losers. That's a key lesson. When you focus on your strengths, focus on what's working well for you. And then obviously it can become the best selling t-shirt of all time. You know, I'm sure that happens in yeah. any case, but what's another example that comes to mind of where you had some sort of insight that unlocked this very successful product or release? Hmm. That's an interesting question. Um, Thank you. I'll take it. <laughs> no, that's really good. One of the brands that I launched with an agency out in San Francisco, our, one of our clients of record was Safeway, the store, which is a yeah. large grocer in the United States. We were responsible for most of their private label brands. And they were launching a brand new private label brand that was in the natural food category. It was pre-prepared food or you know shelf food. And we were developing a brand new brand for them. And we did a lot of focus groups around both the design and the idea of a completely natural food brand. And it was really interesting listening to people and their perceptions around food and around prepared food in comparison to all natural. I did another brand new brand with uh, PetSmart, the um, Simply Nourish brand, which is their private label brand of cat and dog food. And we developed that brand from scratch. And we did the similar thing when we did the designs, the initial concepts, we took them into uh, research, into physical human focus groups. And hearing people's reaction to the design work is really always to me incredibly fascinating to hear how people react to design, to fonts, to colors, to the semiotics of creative work and what it does in terms of motivating them or communicating to them what is, in this case, natural pet food or natural human food. And those are the things to me that I find the most fascinating about design is that colors carry emotional weight fonts carry, you know, intent around some sort of, you know, psychological positioning of a product. And imagery, obviously, you know, drawings, illustrations can drive people one way or another towards a product or away from it. When I worked with um, a big agency working with P&G, P&G had this thing, it was called the 10, 1022 or 1572 or something like that. It was essentially 
in when you're going down an aisle of a store, you're 20 feet away, what's your brand perception? You're 10 feet away, what's your brand perception? You're two feet away, because when you're two feet away, you have to cut through on shelf, because that is the moment of truth where people either bend over to pick up your product or they pick up another product. And that analogy of the 1022 is also the same analogy that you use in any brand, right? Any brand, even in the digital sphere, is that you have to consider what you look like the first time people come across you, the second time, the fifth time. What are you going to do to stand out in order to get people to actually you know, pull the trigger, fill out the form, give you their credit card? That is the science of marketing. And when it, as it relates to design, that is the science of design. How do you hook people in? How do you communicate what you want to communicate to them in an effective way to get them to lean over and pick up that product? Even if it's online. That's right. such a stellar way of looking at it. And you're doing this now with your personal brand. Mm -hmm. As you mentioned, how much you enjoy giving back to, to others and, and younger creatives out there, as well as your company, Verhal Brand Design. Talk about this jump from these giant brands or giant companies to going more on your own and also really focusing on your personal brand. How have you been able to build out the online presence of your personal brand and your company? Sure. I mean, when I went out on my own, I just realized I had, you know, worked with some of the biggest agencies and corporations in the world. And I was just ready to kind of do my own thing. And when I decided to start my consultancy, one of the things that was my mission, my call to action was that I'd use strategic processes and design methodologies to help some of the biggest companies and product brands in the world. And they pay hundreds of thousands of dollars for that kind of work. And I knew that those methodologies and practices could be scaled down so that they could be used and afforded by small to medium sized businesses and even entrepreneurs. And so I made it my mission to take some of those processes and make them simpler and make them easier to communicate and easier to manifest so that I could take those in, in my agency and my consultancy to small to medium sized companies and give them the kind of stellar, you know, motivating rock solid brand and design work that I'd been doing for some of the largest companies in the world. And so that was kind of my out of the gate, you know, motivation. And in order to, I, you know, I'm a design guy. I manage creatives. I've been a business executive in that regard, but I, I don't like doing sales. I mean, in my corporate and agency world, because we were such large companies and agencies, we did business development. Of course, we pitched our little hearts out, but a lot of times business <laughs> came to us. And so now suddenly as an independent consultant, I had to do business development. I had to get myself out there. I had to let people know that I was I was doing work now. And this is the time where I, I realized I had met this watershed moment where I was, you know, I had a great salary, had a nice business card with a great company name on it. And when I went out on my own, I was suddenly like totally naked. Like I didn't have huge salary. I didn't have a big name behind me. I had been managing, you know, huge teams for, a long, for decades. And suddenly it was me in my home office. And facing the internet, you know, and <laughs> I knew nothing about email marketing, list building, lead magnets, Facebook communities. Like I was a complete and utter babe in the woods, but I had all of the deep knowledge about branding and design from my history in the, in the world, but I had to learn all of these new tools totally from scratch. And this was about six years ago. So one of the things I realized that I should do right away was I'd heard about this thing called content marketing and I'd been seeing it, you know, manifesting itself for three or four years. And I was like, I got to do content marketing. So the first thing I knew is that you got to, you know, you don't want to build your brand on borrowed land. You have to build your own email list. So in order to build my email list, I decided to put some lead magnets up on my website drive people to those lead magnets, get them to sign up for my email list. And then I started publishing a newsletter. 
And so I published this newsletter every two weeks for about six to nine months. And I built my email list. And when I got that under my belt and was doing a lot of writing, I was much more comfortable with writing and curating content and communicating directly with my audience. I took the next step and started a YouTube channel because I knew that, okay, I either am going to do a podcast or I'm going to do a YouTube channel. Design is very visual medium. I think video makes sense. So I went with YouTube and I started a YouTube channel. And my goal in starting my YouTube channel was twofold. I had two audiences. I had creative professionals and I had entrepreneurs and small to medium sized businesses. And what I wanted to do is I wanted to teach creative professionals everything I knew about strategic design and branding. But I also wanted to teach all the entrepreneurs and small businesses the same thing. Because what I want to do is I want to increase the knowledge and appreciation for those things in the business community so they can see the value of them and they can understand them better and how they need to put them to use in their business. But then I also want to inform and educate and grow the design and creative professional community so they can do these things that I have kind of gotten better at doing for small, smaller companies. And then push the two together, right? So to make this marriage between entrepreneurship and the creative professionals so they can both be successful. And so that's what I did. I kind of started doing videos once a week. I've been publishing a video once a week for four and a half years now, teaching everything that I know, essentially, but using it as a business development tool. And it was incredibly successful in that regard um, yeah. because people saw me as an expert. They saw that I knew what I was talking about and they contacted me to do business with them. And it's been, I, I call myself like the poster boy of the success of content marketing. I've done zero <laughs> business development, you know, outreach, direct outreach for clients and my agency roster has stayed very, very full. That is amazing. And for somebody who for somebody who admittedly was had completely no idea about this content marketing space when you were getting started and when you were going out on your own to build the online presence and personal brand that you have. And I think, I'm, I'm not sure the exact number, but I think you have like at the time of this recording over 200,000 subscribers on YouTube. Newsletter has over 15,000 subscribers. What's the single biggest thing that you've learned and that you can share with anybody who aspires to grow their pillar content channels like that? I'll add on to that. And I'll say, I've just recently started a Facebook community as well. The brand design masters Facebook group. They, I was just about to say that you, you read my mind, which has only been about, (laughs) it's only about six or eight weeks old and it's got close to a couple thousand members in it. So that's growing too. Congrats on that as well. Well, thank you. And I started a podcast, the Brand Design Masters podcast, which I'm sure you are going to be on, Max, very soon. Oh, I appreciate it. Absolutely. Sign me up. Okay. Excellent. I didn't warn him. him. I was going to say that, by the way. Um, (laughs) I'm shaking in my boots here. (laughs) Then I get to be on the questioning side. Yeah. So I've built this kind of brand ecosystem now. And what was your question? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> what was your that question was, again? That was it. No, for anybody who aspires to, oh, for yeah. anybody who, who's already putting out quality content, but yeah, why can't seem to get over the hump of adding new subscribers? What What's the biggest piece of advice you have for that? The biggest piece of advice I have is you have to give away what you know. You have to give value with no expectation of return. And that is a very scary thing to do. A lot of people said to me at the very beginning of my YouTube channel, they're like, oh my God, you're telling all the secrets of branding. You're like telling everybody how to do this. People will know how to do it now. They're not going to come to you to pay you to do it. They're going to just go off and do it themselves. And here's the thing. When you give value to people and you share processes and methodologies and ideas and design and creative, what that does is it endears them to you. It makes, there's a thing I call subliminal reciprocity, which is if you give people enough value over time, over time, they want to give to you. They feel indebted to you and they want to do business with you. And so, or they want to buy your product or they want to join your Facebook community, whatever that is. You can build up a level of subliminal reciprocity that they want to fulfill if you give them enough value. And here's the other thing about giving away stuff for free is that you are teaching people 
the value of what you do. People from the outside may look and say, oh, you're just teaching them how to do it. It's like you're teaching a guy to fish. He's not going to need you anymore. Well, the thing is, what happens is they just appreciate the value of what you do more and they realize why they have to hire you to do it because it's complicated. You have to be an expert in whatever it is you do, audio editing, video editing, 3D design, architecture, whatever that is. You have to give that stuff away because what that will do will garner you an audience. People will want to come to you more and more and more, and they're going to want to know what's next that you're going to give them. And that's my advice to anybody. So you start off with a, you know, it's as simple as putting a lead magnet on your website, a little simple downloadable checklist or a PDF or a list of resources that people can download for free all they have to do is give you their email address. And then you just have to be good with that, right? You have to be good with the email address. You can't go spamming them every 24 hours with like- Right, or like stuff. every two hours even. Right, you gotta, yeah, you gotta honor that. You really have to honor it. And you don't wanna sell their names and all that sort of stuff. So if you give people value, that is how you draw people to you. It's like throwing bread into a duck pond. <laughs> you know, after yeah, a while, I mean, I mean, the ducks know what you look like and they're going to start swimming over before you even start throwing the bread. I've never heard of it like that before, but I'm a I sucker. I just made for, that up. I'm a sucker for metaphor. Analogy. So that's, I'm going yeah. to use that more. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. You, yeah, you definitely should. And I think that's uh, all in all, it's just a great way to think about it. I mean, when you look at content in a vacuum, like, do you want to be the person that doesn't reveal any secrets and doesn't provide anything useful? Or do you want to be the person that is over the top, helpful and valuable and so willing to share your expertise that people flock to you like ducks in a pond going after bread? How about that? Yeah. Here's another animal analogy for you. The early bird gets the worm. I thought of that myself. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. In the podcasting space, there are plenty of worms to be had. But those worms take a long, long time to get. And as a bird business owner, you have so many things to think about that it doesn't make sense for you to spend all the time and all the effort involved in getting that worm. So you need someone like me, just call me Max, who comes in and saves you time and does whatever he can to take the load off your plate, the behind the scenes, the planning, the production, the promotion of your podcast, Email me at max at hippodirect.com to save time with your podcast and finally create that professionally sounding podcast that your business deserves. Email me at max at hippodirect.com. Now back to Philip the Deuce Van Dusen. So let's switch gears a little bit. Let's get to a segment on inspiration and creativity. So I, I have a hunch that you are a creative person. I don't know why, but... What do you think allows you or what do you do that helps you produce so much creative output? The secret is input. You have to have input to have output. And I tell this story a lot, but there's, there was a book written called Orbiting the Giant Hairball by a guy named Gordon McKinsey. It was written probably 20 years ago. He was That's an long... incredible title, by the way. I know it, it is. It, it's an amazing title. And the analogy behind that is even more amazing. I'll frame it out for you. But so Gordon McKenzie was a longtime creative director at the Hallmark Corporation, was probably one of the most creative, but also bureaucratic companies in the United States at the time. And he wrote this book on how to, how to navigate the bureaucracy, the hairball of business as a creative. And you have to learn how to orbit the hairball without getting caught in it. And that's where the title comes from. But one of the stories he tells in the book, which I love, and I've actually, I've actually hosted creative um, kind of inspiration seminars called Pasture because of this analogy that he had. And the analogy is this, designers are like cows. I know it sounds cruel, but designers are like cows. You have to let cows out of the barn to eat grass, drink water, get sunshine. Because if you keep a cow in the barn forever and you just milk it, milk it, milk it, Eventually, a cow comes up dry and nothing comes out. You have to let the cow out to breathe, eat, experience, get sunlight, socialize, have fun, run around, because that's the input that enables the output 
in the barn. And, you know, how do I stay creative? How do I stay inspired? I concentrate on input. I'm constantly looking at design work, agency work, what companies are doing, you know, what's happening on social media. I, you know, on Pinterest, I feed my mind all the time with creative inspiration, marketing inspiration. And I synthesize that and I output that in my teaching, in my agency work, in my content. And that's one of the things that has made me the most successful on YouTube is I do a trend graphic design trend video every year. And those have like massively blown up because people love to be inspired. Designers and creatives know that they have to have that input in order to output. So if there is a secret to creativity, it's about taking in. That's a beautiful synthesis. And I'm loving these animal analogies, by the way. Oh, I got has, a lot of them. Has me <laughs> wagging my tail. <laughs> but the input, the input is clearly so super important, especially in the creative sense. What other ways do you like to let yourself out to roam around the farm or however, <laughs> however you want to say it? But what are your favorite hobbies or just ways to kind of give your mind a break from actually working on things? Yeah, I'm a, I've been a musician my whole life. So I play guitar, bass. I've always recorded and written, you know, multi-track songs since I was a teenager. So I've always done that. And recently in the last couple of years, I've taken up, but I've always been self-taught and I have never known how to read music. And so a couple of years ago, I was... I was trying to figure out what the hell I was going to get my wife for Christmas. And I knew that she had played piano before and had mentioned that she might want to start playing again. And so I thought, oh, I'll get an electric piano and then we'll both take lessons. I've always wanted to learn piano. So I've been taking piano and learning to read music over the last year and a half. And it has been absolutely incredibly inspiring. And it has been great input to my creativity. So music is one of the things that early in my career, I just relegated to be quote unquote a hobby, but it's a creative outlet that I have that no one can put their finger on. No one can touch, no one can critique. And I just do it for myself. I also have, you were wagging your tail before. I Still have am. two, two um, 110 pound Shiloh shepherds, uh, long haired shepherds who keep me very busy with dog walking and playing and hiking, which is another one of my passions or my, my big dogs. And then I'm also an avid scuba diver. So before COVID, anyway, of I tried to get out and scuba dive as much as I possibly can. That's a wonderful mix there. And 110 pounds sounds like no joke, especially a couple times over. Yeah. Let's get to a fan favorite segment called the wild business shout out of the week. The wild business shout out of the week. Okay. Wild business shout out of the week. This is where we talk about a campaign or brand that caught our attention. And there's something that involves a quote unquote burger and uh, Snoop Dogg. Tell us about it. Yeah, absolutely. I am a carnivore. And I also know, though, that man's proclivity to eat meat is pretty bad for the environment, right? Americans eat over 50 billion hamburgers a year. And one of the biggest contributors to greenhouse you know, gases is cows. And in particular, the methane from cows, from their burps and the other end as well. <laughs> I've seen stuff. I've seen a yeah, lot about that it's on Twitter. Crazy. And so I... And I, and I love a good burger, I tell you. And my wife bought some Beyond Burger a few weeks ago and brought it home and said, let's try this. And I was like, okay, let's try it. You know, having absolutely no hope in hell that this was going to be any good. Anyway, Beyond Burgers are freaking fantastic. I actually think I prefer Beyond Burgers to regular hamburgers. <laughs> wow. And which is a lot because I'm like, you know, like I said, I'm a carnivore. Yeah, that's coming from a carnivore. Yeah, and Beyond Burger might have to start making like prime rib at some point, but until they do, I'm still eating prime rib. <laughs> but yeah. the marketing, wild, you know, business growth marketing campaign that kind of <laughs> caught my eye recently was a Beyond Burger promotion that they, the Beyond Burger company did a promotion with Dunkin' Donuts where they hired Snoop Dogg to serve breakfast sandwiches <laughs> in Dunkin' Donuts. And they called it the Beyond D-O-double-G breakfast sandwich. And 
not only was the sausage in the sandwich made of Beyond Burger, which shocked everybody who was eating it, but they also made it a super special sandwich, I guess, out of the creative mind of Snoop Dogg, where they made a breakfast sandwich on a, not an English muffin, no, not a biscuit, no, on a glazed donut. So they split a glazed donut and they put sausage, cheese, and egg on a glazed donut. And that was the Beyond D-O double G breakfast <laughs> sandwich from Snoop Dogg, which I thought was nuts. It's totally nuts. It's like that sandwich that KFC did, right? Where it was made out of two yeah, pieces yeah. of chicken with chicken in the center. It was like the, the chicken sandwich. But it's a perfect example of leveraging an influencer doing something that garners has a lot of legs for garnering social media attention and viral sharing. And it's something that's innovative and good for the planet, meaning it has good intention. Now, granted the glazed donut on a breakfast sandwich for the obese Americans that we are, maybe not the best thing to do, but the Beyond Burger part and promoting Beyond Burger, I think is a very noble, product or brand to advocate for. So I congratulate Snoop for doing that. And um, I found it to be absolutely fun and fascinating campaign. It's an amazing combo of a few different things and people there. It makes me think of an early guest I had on Drew Davis, who has this concept in book called brandscaping. And what a brandscape is, is when two or three, or it could be, could be even more brands get together and have some sort of marketing efforts that is beneficial to every party involved. And what you just described is a perfect example of that because you have the Beyond Burger, you have Dunkin' Donuts, you have Snoop Dogg, you have your stomach, which is very happy thinking about it. It's just a, an amazing combo of different things there. So I think that's a really cool example. And now I'm craving this sort of unique combination of I know, things I'm, I'm, I'm hand like delivered time. by Snoop. Yes, exactly. And I think you're exactly right. And this is, that is one of the key cornerstones of success in the creative economy, I think, is that brandscaping, is where you are partnering with other either product development, service providers, influencers, and grouping together around a particular cause or campaign or product. And because here's the strength in it. And it's just like this, Max. It's just like you inviting me on your podcast because you're going to promote the podcast, but I'm also going to promote yeah, the podcast. I, I might, right? you know, if I get a little tired. Then. Yeah. So I'm, I'm leverage. You're smart by inviting me on because you know that I'm going to leverage my audience to promote your podcast. Your podcast audience is going to grow because I'm exposing it to my very large audience. And doing that sort of partnership thing is so important in today's marketing economy because you, and this goes back to your original question about how do you grow to your audience? And I said, you know, lead magnet and email list and stuff like that. Here's the other way you grow your audience. You leverage other people's audiences. You get on other people's shows. You give other people value who already have audiences and you show up, provide them value and then you get exposure to their audiences and more and more people find out about you. That's another real key unlock to building your audience is finding where you can credibly uh, show up and add real value to another community and gather and garner the attention of that community. That's spot on. And thank you very much for the support. I appreciate it. Oh, yeah. and, and that's one of the things that I love one of the reasons why I love interview podcasts so much is because every single episode, there's a new audience there on both sides and a whole new world of potential connections that it opens the doors for the host as well as the guest to. And you just never know what ideas it might create for the listeners as well. So it's such a neat, it's, it's another example of landscaping. You mentioned, you know, when I started off, one of my first exposures to personal branding was Chris Tucker, who's a friend of yours and mine. Yes, episode well. 99, not that I, you know, not to be specific, but. Amazing guy. So the first time I heard about Chris Tucker, I heard Pat Flynn mention him on his yes. podcast. Love him. So by mentioning <clears throat> or listening to interviews on, you know, the first guy I came across was Pat Flynn. And then I met Chris Tucker through him. And then John Lee Dumas, and then 
Amy Porterfield. And then it just goes on and on and on, right? Then Amy Landino and Roberto Blake. And then you just, yeah. you learn and, and are kind of passed along and get exposure to other people through people. So that's how it's done. And the longer you do it and the more focused on quality and just being genuinely kind and, and helpful to others, the, the more possibilities it opens. So it's really cool to think about that. All right, let's wrap up with some rapid fire Q and A. You ready for it? Go, man. All right, let's go. Let's get wild. What is your favorite computer program or software? I don't know what term you prefer, but for designing things. For designing things, Illustrator. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I know. At least previously, you've literally walked around Manhattan selling T-shirts. What would you say is your favorite area of Manhattan to walk around and kind of just experience? Uh, the East Village. Oh, great. Great area. What is your biggest pet peeve? Wow, that's a good one. My biggest pet peeve. That's the one one that I didn't really give any thought to at all. Um, Maybe it's not giving thought to questions <laughs> in advance. <laughs> that's it. That's <laughs> it. Right. You know what? That question's like, Max, that question is like, you know, when you're in an interview and people and the interviewer asks you like, what's your greatest weakness? And then you come up with something that's like, oh, I work too hard, you know? So it's like this thinly veiled positivity about yourself. That's kind of what the pet peeve question is about. But I would say, I think the pet peeve question for me is people who don't give enough value, really, honestly, who make it more about them than their audience. And that is the easiest thing to recognize and the biggest turnoff. Absolutely. And what is your favorite type of music to play? Alt rock. Oh, nice. You have a favorite alt rock band of all time? Of all time, the Pixies. Oh, nice. Either that or Husker Du, one of the two. Nice. Shout out to Baser. Yes. And then what is a, other than your music and your creative abilities, what is a weird talent that you have? Something that could be something really small, like hanging up picture frames the right way or a memory trick or something that doesn't have an impact on your business, but you just have a knack for doing it. When I was a kid, I loved balancing things. I could balance just about anything on my head. <laughs> so a chair, Wait, broomstick, was... rake, a toy, tripod. Yeah. I, oh I used God. to like put things on my nose and balance them. I don't know if you were destined to be in the circus or destined to be a seal in your <laughs> other life, but that is right. an amazing talent. That's very cool. I totally, and, and, and it's a perfect analogy for business. You have the balance there. Well, Philip, thank you so much for your balance throughout this entire interview. This is amazing. <laughs> Blown away by your background, going all the way back to your family's roots before it was even New York, all the way through what you're doing today and just very inspired by what you do and the messages that you share. So thanks again for coming on. And what is the best place for people to connect with you, your company, your podcast, anything you want to shout out? If you want to connect with me, the only thing you really need to remember is my name, philipvandusen.com, and the words Brand Design Masters. I have a Brand Design Masters Facebook group. I have a Brand Design Masters podcast. I have a Brand Design Masters Guild, which is my private paid mastermind group. So go to philipvandusen.com, best place to find me. My YouTube channel is under the same name, and all of my stuff is there. Perfect. And then last thing here, final thoughts. Stage is yours. It could be a quote. It could be a verse. Whatever you want. Send us off here. A verse? Oh, man. You are hard. I swear. You are so Thank hard. Thank you. That's what she said. <laughs> <laughs> Could, couldn't resist. Let's end, let's end with your quote. Yeah. Let's end with your <laughs> quote. My favorite quote is by Dr. Seuss. And it says, be who you are and say what you feel because those who mind don't matter and those who matter don't mind. Just what the doctor ordered. Thank you, Philip, for sharing your amazing story and roots back to the 1600s and your thoughts on creativity, design, personal branding, and more. And thank you, wild listeners, for tuning in to another episode. 
If you want to hear another wild story like this one, make sure to subscribe to this podcast on your favorite app and leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. You can also find us on Good Pods, where you can find all the podcasts your friends, family, and other favorite people are tuning into. In addition, check out everything HippoDirect has to offer for your business at HippoDirect.com and connect with us on social media at the handles HippoDirect and Max Brandstetter. Until next time, let your business run wild. Bring on the bongos! Bongos!